met with this uh, priest who eats at basil. <laughs> There's an article about him. He's a Catholic. Oh, is that the? It was an old article. Yeah, a couple of months ago. Yeah. Anyway, right, right across Eastern Parkway, he's uh, he's he he like revived the whole church because it was old and boring, and he brought in new excitement and he has activities for the teenagers and he's doing great things. So I met with him and I asked him. Besides your social activities, what are you teaching? What's your message? What is your religion? Whatever. So he said, I'm trying to convince them that it is their responsibility to correct the world. But wow. Not, not to convert Jews or anything? <laughs> not to make blood libels? No. To, to correct the world? I said, that, that, that was very nice. But I asked him, why? Why do we need to correct the world? I mean, we live in Crown Heights. Let's correct Crown Heights. What do you worry about the whole world? He says, so what, what's the answer? So I said, who needs the world corrected? <laughs> we? Or the creator of the world? It's true. It's our job to correct the world. But for whose benefit? Obviously for the Creator's benefit. It's his world. Who worries about it more than him? Who has more invested in it than him? Who hurts more when the world is bad than the Creator, who created it to be good? I was very surprised by his reaction. His reaction was, I knew it. <laughs> I thought he'd give me an argument. Because what do you mean, God needs, God hurts? He said, I knew it. He said, all through school, divinity school, whatever, seminary, whatever you went to. Not sem. <laughs> Catholic seminaries or whatever. He said, all through school, I never felt comfortable with what, we, with what they were teaching. Because what they were taught was that there's God in heaven, or the Father, and then there's God on earth, the Son. And what they taught was that the Son feels your pain and suffers with you and worries about you, but the Father, God in heaven, He's perfect and untouchable. Never has a bad day. He says, I, I never liked that. I never felt comfortable with that. What kind of father doesn't care? The son cares and not the father? That's wrong. He says, I knew it. <laughs> so it's starting to dawn on people that as much as we think we have problems, we're really here to solve his problems. But if you don't think he has a problem, then it's back to you again, and you are the center of the universe. Am I going to get to heaven? Am I going to be a tzaddik? If you don't think he has problems, then you think he's perfect. He created his own problems. So do you. <laughs> it's his world, so. <laughs> huh? He made his own problems. Yeah, he made his own problems. What so is he doing this for? He could just he fix it himself. So if he made his own problems, then you have no rahmanas for him? No. no. He can Guys, the way your... you help someone fix their own problems what do you mean all your ignore problems? them. Violence <laughs> is their catch and makes your own stupid problem. I'm like, hey, get out of here. Oh, You'll for sure. Out there. No. Like, like, making all... yourself nervous. Go go, get, be nervous by yeah, yourself. You mean every problem you have, you made. Okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, there's people that have problems made problem for them. Well, That's not true. Like, so, like, so, so what do you? What tragedy happened? How did you create that? Yeah, so, I made someone so. die. I'm My little thing. So what do you? So what do you do if after five thousand seven hundred and seventy-one years, David still can't solve his problem? Are you gonna have Rahmanus now? 
How long are you gonna wait? You can snap his fingers. fingers on I'll be like, I can't sell my own problems after well, fifteen years. You go know get help you elsewhere. Know that technically you can just go <laughs> and if he can, yeah. If he can, then how can we do it? Uh, <laughs> it's very confusing. He can do whatever he wants. And you know what he wants? <laughs> so he can make us do it. He's so proud. What does he want from us? Maybe he's not so proud. Hey, that's what I'm saying. I know, that's what I said. <laughs> okay, so now let me tell you the really sad story. <clears throat> you know that famous marshal that um, the king had a son who was very sick, and the only th- and the, the only th- and the only thing that could save him is if you grind up the stone from the from the crown. Mm-hmm. And by the time they decided to grind up the stone, the son was so sick that even if they gave it to him, a lot of it would spill and be wasted. And the king said, do it anyway. Because if it can save the sun, it's worth it, right? What is the, what is the nimshal? Hasidus, Kabbalah, is the diamond in the crown. And it was never revealed before. It was never given to people. By the time the al came along, if they would, if t- if Hasidus would be taught, some of it would spill, and uh, that's why there was Yud, Yud Tes Kislev, and the Rebbe went to jail, and then it was decided in heaven that even if it spills, it's okay because you have to save. What is this spilling? Huh? It'll go to low places. It doesn't mean that there will be uh, Tanya in a library where there are no Jews. No, that's fine. What it means is this. What is Hasidus going to tell you that might save your life? Might save Yiddishkeit? Hasidus is going to tell you that the Ebeshter is very desperate and needs you to do the mitzvah and make a dira betachtainim desperately. How does how is that going to spill? Some people will say, "He needs it." What kind of God is that? So instead of being inspired to serve Him, it will actually make people lose respect for Him. That's like parents who don't want to tell you how desperate they how desperate they are for you to be good, how much it hurts them when you're not good. They don't really tell you until they have a heart attack and then they blame it on you. <laughs> <laughs> because the same way, like, you couldn't answer her question because you didn't know the problem. How, why should we do it if we don't know what he wants? We know exactly what he wants. Well, why? What's the problem? What, is what are we solving? His need for a dinner. Why he created? Yeah, that's not even a nice question. Well, you can't ask them why they want to. Well, a nice question? No. If somebody says, I need something, yeah. <laughs> if somebody says, I need something, and you say, hey, what do you need that for? That's not nice. Even for, even for a human being. So if a wife says to a husband, I need you to do this, and he says, what for? That's nasty. <laughs> so what does she need him for? What's the difference? It'll make, it'll make it easier for you. No, hey, oh, oh yeah. If it'll, make it, yeah. if it'll make it easier for you to do it, then you're really asking a decent question. You're not just saying, what for? Right. Well, if I knew if, why, maybe I'd be more willing to do it. Okay. Then why? Well, then let's learn. If, but well, to say he needs, well, then it's his problem. Let him solve it himself. That's the danger. No, no. I, I'm willing to help, but I need to know why. No, I'm just saying that the danger of the spilling is that people will say, eh, "I can't. I can't worship a god that needs." That means he's not perfect. That's true. He's not perfect enough for me. <laughs> so here's the thing anytime I say this to people who are not religious and I say the mitzvahs are basically God's wish list this is what he needs from us we're not doing it to get anything from him they become so inspired so nobody told us this but when I say it to religious people like in Williamsburg 
They actually say, well, if he needs it, let him do it. <laughs> they actually say that. By us helping, it's better for us. You know? Of course. So why not? Huh? So we help. Why don't we? No, we do. So why are we arguing? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, we're not arguing. <laughs> but it will be better for you. This makes sense? Yeah. Okay. So in order in order to appreciate going back to the first question, in order to appreciate what does Bittle mean, if you don't think that he needs, then there is no Bittle. Because what are you going to be a bottle to? If he doesn't need anything, so what are you devoting yourself to? What are you humbling yourself to? There's nothing there. <clears throat> so it seems like the crisis in Yiddishkeit today is this one question. Does he really need the mitzvah? And do you care? That's it. That's the whole issue. <coughs> so, <clears throat> if he really needs the mitzvah and you care, that's Bittel. You care about his need? That's, that's Edelkeit. That means you're out of the box. If you say, he needs, why should I care? You're stuck in the box. You're just being a typical human being. He's got his problems, I got mine. That's so predictable. That's so human. Or, if you say, he needs me to do this, okay. And what do I get for it? See, that's so predictable. That's so human. <laughs> for a couple of years, it's fun. But after a while, you really have to outgrow it because it's getting boring. I think one of the one of the worst things is to be predictable. Well, say you're always stunning. Is that that's predictable? But it's good predictable for a while. But then there has to be. But there has to be some outcome from that. Well, there's outcome. There's outcome. You get good marks to your test. There was one year that Ebba told us to do a project with children, to get children to say. So uh, in Minnesota, I printed up like a long sheet. I put Maidani on top, Shema Yisrael at the bottom. And then under that, a, a little tear-off piece where you check off each day said Maidani, said Shema, said Maidani, said Shema, right? And I said, if you do this for a week, you bring in this tear-off piece signed by your... I went to the Talmud Torahs, spoke to each of the classes, and told them to bring back, at the end of the week, bring back this little thing with your parents' signature, and you get a prize. So I went from class to class in all the Talmud Torahs. The second class was... Eight-year-olds. I walk in and I give them the whole thing and I tell them, this is the Modani, you say it first thing in the morning, this is the Shema before you go to sleep. You do this for a week and you sign it and you bring it in and you'll get a prize. And this little girl raises her hand, eight years old, not from at all. And she says, you don't have to give us a prize for doing good things. I was <laughs> like, <laughs> So I, um, I said, no, you don't get a prize for saying the Modani. You get the prize for being, bringing in. The <laughs> <laughs> but that is so out of the box. 